Actually, if you remember in the last talk, I briefly spoke about uh, what my lab has been doing in the field of uh, single cell genomics and transcriptomics to be more precise. Right? I didn't really talk about uh, the other research direction which we pursue in our lab, uh, which is uh, liquid biopsy. And this is more translational. While the single cell research that I discussed was mostly uh, fundamental in nature, mostly you can say basic research, whereas this that I'm sharing now mm -hmm. is more uh, on the translational side. And if time permits, I'll also show you some other applications. So liquid biopsy is all about cancer here. So I, liquid biopsy can be implemented in any uh, disease, but I will be talking primarily about cancer because my lab works on cancer mostly. If time permits, I will also talk more about the other kind of translations that we are doing, such as precision oncology and stuff like that. Okay, let's see how much time we have. So, what is liquid biopsy? Liquid biopsy by liquid, mm -hmm. uh, I mean the tissue, right? The tissue, the only liquid tissue that we are interested in is uh, our blood. Okay, so blood is liquid and it is easily accessible, right? For any kind of diagnostics, it's very easy to access your blood. Somebody, a phlebotomist can come in the morning to your house and draw a blood. And if by examining that blood, he can tell you about the onset of a certain disease, then it is great. It is inexpensive. It is not that invasive in nature as well and uh, it is easy to implement and cost effective so it has all these important features but what is most important is that how accurate is this method okay so you'll see some use cases today so if you see this picture it has been taken from a recent review by one of my collaborators uh, stephanie jeffrey who was the inventor of uh, the triple negative breast cancer and uh, who served as a full professor in Stanford University for nearly three, four decades. Now she has retired. <laughs> she is a very uh, good collaborator and quite a knowledgeable person in breast cancer primarily. And she was the pioneer of using single cells in liquid biopsy research. Okay, so what this review, uh, what this picture tells you is what are the different kinds of liquid biopsy interventions, right? So you have this cancer here. This is the tumor. It could be a solid tissue, right? It's a solid tumor. It is not a blood cancer per se. And this is the blood vessel. So the tumor cells are of different kinds and different clones can exist in a tumor. So you see this, there are different colors here. And all these colors indicate different clones. So cancer is so challenging to treat because of the fact that the cell types are very different. In the normal tissue, the cells are pretty much homogeneous, whereas in cancer, the same, same cells diverge into quite heterogeneous subpopulations and thereby making it very challenging for you to decide a treatment for that. Okay. Now, what happens is uh, the, the cancer grows in phases, right? Uh, so initially, it is completely localized and then it is locally, then it starts expanding locally and then it starts falling into the bloodstream. So here, as you can see, when the cancer cells fall into the bloodstream, they're called circulating tumor cells. The circulating tumor cells, by the way, so just for you to know that cancer cells are, you know, epithelial cells. Most of our cancers, 95% of the cancers are cancers of the epithelial cells. And epithelial cells are basically the, on the, <clears throat> so for example, our skin is epithelial. So every organ has a layer of, uh, I would say, skin and that is epithelia, okay? So cancer is caught by the epithelial cells typically because they define the cover of every organ. So now these cells fall into the bloodstream and then they migrate to different distant locations. And you see, this is the primary tumor and this migrates to distant locations here. So for example, it is colonizing in the lungs, right? And creating a tumor here. It is colonizing in liver, it is creating a tumor here, right? So this happens only in the late three or fourth stage of the cancer. And by the time you discover that, you are pretty much close to your death. So this is really because uh, typically in a tertiary care hospital, uh, people reach a doctor or a hospital only at a very late stage. That's the irony of cancer. You get to know it really very late. So apart from CTC, what other biomarker you have? You have circulating 
tumor cell clusters. So circulating tumor cells come together and they form cluster or they migrate as clusters. So as clusters, they migrate better. The potential for them to migrate to distant locations and colonization is much more in the CTC clusters as compared to the single circulating tumor cells. Okay, so and there are circulating tumor DNA because tumor cells die as well. And when they die, they shed off uh, this circulating tumor DNA. The DNAs and the RNAs come into the bloodstream. And you can also collect the circulating tumor DNA on the RNA, or you can profile them and you can, uh, you know, make predictions if you like. Okay. But in 2015, there was a group in Sweden which came up with this observation that even the blood platelets, by the way, the circulating tumor cells, the circulating tumor DNA, all these are in rarity in your blood. You don't have a plenty of any of these biomarkers. In your so these are the practical problems. So I, I always encourage you guys to think about the practicality of whatever you do. Okay. Accuracy is one thing. You can get great accuracy by using XYZ methods. But what is important is for you to understand the real picture. Unless you understand the real picture, you can never contribute something meaningfully. Okay. So the problem with CTC is that it is very, very rare. And you need new kinds of devices with which you can detect circulating tumor cells. And those machines are not available in India. That is very expensive. Okay, now platelets. Uh, platelets are all over the places, right? They are quite abundant in blood. And they reach out every uh, location of your body just because they are as part of your blood itself. Now, what the scientists found out is this Swedish group reported in 2015 that platelet transcriptome, that means the RNA expression in platelets undergo huge changes uh, in cancer. And not only changes, that change happens in the early time, right? As compared to CTC, CTC fall into the bloodstream only at the late stage of the cancer, right? When the cancer has started metastasizing. Whereas platelets pick up the signal from the cancer cells even at a very early stage. And that is what they have showed. That you can actually predict the onset of the cancer by looking at the platelet RNA uh, composition. Okay. You should also remember that platelets are anucleated cells. They are cell fragments. They are not even cells. They don't have their own nuclear, uh, you know, nuclear. acids they don't have their own dna there wherever they go they collect some nucleic acids and they keep circulating so by this virtue they actually learn a lot from the tumor so we call them tumor educated platelet own liquid biopsy method to detect cancer quite accurately. So there are different points of intervention for liquid biopsy. You can detect cancer early. You can use it for surveillance. All these methods you can use for surveillance. You can use it for the detection. You can use it for the treatment selection. So in the entire course of your cancer management, uh, all these biomarkers are extremely useful because they are cost effective, easy to access from blood, right? And easy to implement in many of the cases. Okay, so just going forward, I have already spoken a lot about the cancer metastasis. So I don't want to reiterate on that. So I'll move forward. So importance of CTCs um, have also been covered a lot. Uh, so let us just go through these points very quickly. Uh, what are the importances and the challenges with regards to the CTC detection? CTC detection and characterization matters. Why? CTCs can be used for blood-based cancer detection. CTCs can help decide treatment. By the way, CTCs mean circulating tumor cells. Don't forget that. Is your cancer cell into the blood circulation? CTCs can indicate treatment response uh, <clears throat> as well. The challenges, both primary cancer and CTCs are highly heterogeneous, right? CTCs do, uh, may not look like epithelial cells. This is the biggest problem because circulating tumor cells for the epithelial, because epithelial tissue, if you ever look at the epithelial tissue, they are very tightly bound, right? They are like layers, uh, stick to each other. But that is not, uh, you know, good for migration. 
So that kind of a cellular morphology is not good for the migration of the cells. For migration, you need more kind of a spindle-like structure, right? So that they can rub on each other and they can easily live their original site, okay? And they therefore transit into another state, which is called the metast uh, you know, mesenchymal. So if you, because all these methods that I talked about, CTC detection and all, they're all antibody affinity based methods. If you don't have APCAM on your circulating tumor cell surface, then you cannot detect it. Only a small fraction of uh, epithelial like cells you can detect from blood and you will miss on other kinds of cells. This is why it is so very important to develop methods which don't rely on any particular marker. So because we are a computational lab primarily, although we do a lot of weight labs these days, but my training is in computer science and most of my students are, you know, trained in computer science related methods. So we asked that, can we design, uh, design a classifier or can we design a machine learning based system which can actually, uh, which don't care about like what a single marker is expressed or not, right? So that is the question. You cannot base your, uh, you know, you cannot have the foundation Of the biology right you understand this question i'm asking to the students you can i don't know you you cannot open your mic but this is a very important question right can we detect circulating tumor cells without enriching them for any specific marker this is the holy grail of cancer biology because if you can do that you know different kinds of phenotypes that exist there right for the circulating tumor cells and and then you can catch them you can analyze them sorry and you can you can make use of them for clinical purposes so this is what we thought of as a solution which is microfluidics plus ai so we for the first time brought microfluidics uh, in tandem with ai into the picture for accomplishing what i am talking here and microfluidics means i am not an expert of microfluidics let me call it out Right. I am not a microfluidics guy. I have no idea how it works. I have some idea how it works. India, right? So some of my good collaborators are champions in microfluidics. They build some of the initial microfluidic systems for single cell detection and such. So they reached me out for my single cell works and then we started discussing about microfluidics. I'll talk about them as well. So what we did was very simple. We took a PBMC. So there are plenty of single cells, single cell data in the NCBI gene expression omnibus. So we took up a lot of uh, blood uh, cell, uh, single cell RNA sequencing data, and we took a lot of circulating tumor cell data, single cell RNA sequencing data, and we integrated them, right? And we used them for the prediction of, we built model which can predict whether it is a CTC or it is a WBC, okay? So that's the simple problem. So we post a fairly well understood molecular biology problem as a computational problem. So this is another thing where I want to stress upon. I think for all of you, because see, we are in not a very rich country, right? But we have our computer, we have our data. The real good thing that we can do is we can get hold of the data that is out there in public and make use of that nicely, right? And then we can do small little bit of validation. You can always go and talk to your supervisors that why don't you have, talk to your friends and get this validated. I think they'll be more than happy to do that if you do a nice job, okay? So, so this is the thing that we did. We combined, we integrated a lot of single cell data from blood and circulating tumor cells and we made a model which can predict <clears throat> whether it's a CTC or WBC. And here we didn't make a lot of mathematical contributions. Okay, let me just call it out. 
and you can see the composition is such that there is a huge skew towards the breast cancer circulating tumor. These are known circulating tumor cells which have been enriched with methods which are completely reliable. So, yeah, 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 just before that, just before that. Yeah, just open this. Thank you. Okay, guys, I can continue. I think the recording has again started. So here you go. So what I was talking about was that we use the publicly available data, the PBMCs and circulating tumor cells, and we created a database for ourselves, and we integrated the data from multiple studies, and we built a classifier which can predict circulating tumor cells and, um, and WBCs, right? And the composition is something that you can see on the right-hand side that what were the fraction of different kinds of cells. We only had 558 cells in our CDC database, which we have now expanded in our current work, which is unpublished and thereby I'm not showing it here. Please uh, move forward, Jaspreet. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to uh, do a sanity check that whether the CTCs that you have accumulated are really circulating tumor cells and the blood ones are the real blood cells. So we actually looked at some of the canonical markers here. So you can see the vimentin is up in the blood and then PTP. And of course, in some of the circulating tumor cells, also the vimentin is up because those are more mesenchymal like, right? Because I told you that for the, for the cells to migrate, they need to be mesenchymal. And when they become mesenchymal, they express uh, mesenchymal markers, which are, uh, you know, vimentin is one of the mesenchymal markers. So you can see the PRC is basically the CD45, and that is up in the blood. And as you can see, a lot of KRT uh, markers, the keratins and the EPCAMs are all up. So this is a good ground truth data. You can see the blood markers are up in the blood and the epithelial markers are up in the circulating tumor cells. Yeah, let us move forward. Okay, so here we showed for the first time that all the circulating tumor cells actually uh, rest on uh, epithelial mesenchymal axis, right? So if you see the figure one here, figure A, that shows that the epithelial and mesenchymal signature are perfectly anti-correlated. That is expected. I'm not saying it is something new, but nobody has shown this on such a large amount of data across markers. So I'm not showing only vimentin. I'm not showing only some of the uh, a handful of epithelial markers. I'm showing a large number of epithelial and mesenchymal markers, and I'm combining them using a cumulative uh, score. And then I'm showing not a single marker, but the overall anti-correlation of the epithelial and the mesenchymal markers. And it turns out that circulating tumor cells, some of them are epithelial in nature and some of them are mesenchymal in nature. So they actually lie on an epithelial to mesenchymal and chemical transition quite perfectly. So the figure C, there is another. So one of the authors of the study is John Paul Theory, who was the inventor of, of epithelial to mesenchymal transition in the cancer. He was the first one who showed it, it is in cancer. So he developed a score as well for the same thing. And you can see that our score is much more linearly related. Uh, the two different components are much more re linearly related as compared to their scores. And he himself helped helped me uh, compute this score. Uh, and he's one of the senior authors of the paper. Now you can see on the right hand side is uh, basically we we uh, sort of uh, ranked the cells based on their epithelial to mesenchymal. So the ratio of their epithelial and mesenchymal signatures. And you can see that the cells uh, exist on a perfect uh, continuum of epithelial to mesenchymal transition. Uh, which is the, I think, the most solid evidence so far, data-backed evidence that even the circulating tumor cell themselves are conclusion is that sorry uh, the earlier figure only so the conclusion is the yeah so the conclusion is that epithelial to mesenchymal transition is not the only mechanism by which cells 
Your connection is breaking very often, the barka. Just read, uh, I said, I said, let us move to the next slide, please. Not hear you in between. So it's breaking very often. Oh, is it breaking very often? Okay. I don't know. I mean, thanks to the Wi-Fi. Uh, yeah. So, so anyway, so the system that we built was following, and this is in collaboration with. Uh, in collaboration with uh, Fluidime. Fluidime is a NASDAQ listed company uh, in US. And they had developed a method which we published for the first time here, which says, uh, okay, no, not that we published the first time, but I think the, the, this is composed of two different components. One is the, uh, as you can see, the blood is collected, then it is actually subjected to a microfluidic device, which basically enriches for the uh, large cells because typically the cancer cells are larger than are larger than the blood cells so this system basically the clear cell system which was already published this basically enriches the large uh, sized cells uh, from the blood right and then we actually uh, remove the uh, wbcs right we re we do a negative enrichment of the wbcs right by cd45 and cd31 right and and then we collect the single uh, cells the single potential circulating tumor cells using a machine called polaris it's a very expensive device it basically helps you to capture circulating tumors uh, to capture single cells and incubate single cells and stain single cells everything can be done in this machine finally we actually went on for the sequencing of the single cells so this is the process by which we uh, got the blood and from the blood we uh, from the patient blood we got the potential circulating tumor cells please move on to the next slide just wait so here some basic uh, machine learning methods have been used to uh, uh, on top of some integrated data analysis uh, so some methods for integrative data analysis like you know on the original data without any batch effect removal uh, you can see the green box plots. So the accuracies are okay, but it's kind of variable, I would say. Uh, so with uh, different methods, we get different kinds of accuracy, I would say. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, integration uh, really helps. Okay, so Harmony and PCA they give uh, consistently high uh, the PCA based uh, integration. They give consistently high accuracy so please move on to the next slide so this is the classification of the wbcs and the ctcs okay and uh, also when we look at it on the uh, principal component plot uh, by the way so we used a batch effect removal method called um, uh, called uh, 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 I, I reference component analysis which we published uh, in 2017 in nature genetics so you can refer to that work so it basically projects the single cells on the bulk expression profiles, thereby mitigating the batch effects. So as you can see that the blood cells, which are marked by red, are completely segregated from the heterogeneous pool of circulating tumor cells, which come from different, different studies. So our cells can be found in the middle of all the circulating tumor cells, right, which are marked by black. So we tested. So basically, uh, this shows that the classifier as well as the simple uh, integrative analysis actually helps you to segregate the blood cells from the circulating tumor cells. So you can, now this is made on a lot of markers, not a single markers, like 300, 400 variable genes. Okay, so this is less likely to fail to recognize a circulating tumor cell that is atypical. For example, if you look at the black dots, those are the cells that we got from our device. Our device does not select for doesn't do any kind of positive enrichment for EPCAM or anything like the other methods. So therefore, these are cells which don't even express, many of these cells actually don't express any epithelial markers, but still 
they get classified as circulating tumor cells. This is exactly what we wanted to achieve. We wanted to train it on a lot of CTCs and WBCs, and then we wanted to demonstrate that we can actually predict the phenotype of a single circulating tumor cell which does not have any epithelial marker. Right? Okay. Move on to the next slide. So this uh, this is the publication. It has got quite a bit of traction in the last year. It is just 2020, pub, you know, published in a MDPI journal. So uh, so people are referring to this study a lot. So I'm quite happy for that. Okay. Next. Okay. So I'll just move on. Sorry, uh, because I'm uh, you know running a bit late. So I'll just move on. super useful and also detection of ctc is tough because they are rare in blood i also told you about the tuber educated platelets in the beginning so tuber this is another schematic showing it. So we got a data from best British group, basically. So they did uh, transcriptal cancer patients uh, composed of the following groups like glioblastoma, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, non-small cell lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and hepatobiliary cancer. And of course, there are healthy donors, 55 healthy donors, right? So they did RNA sequencing. So we use this data to sort of crunch down uh, the number of genes because they provided a list of thousand genes and they suggested that if you use this thousand genes you can classify cancer of any kind and any stage with an accuracy of uh, 94 or 95 percent by the way it was uh, i shouldn't say this because this is on the recording but we could not uh, reproduce the accuracy when we tried it, uh, that maybe we did something wrong. Okay, just uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just with hello. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, how do you develop a diagnostic test? So, we narrowed the gene set again. So, it's always very interesting for me to do simple things that I learned. Um, you know, in machine learning and then implement that in the real life. We talk about uh, uh, feature selection. All of us, all the students who are attending this, they have heard of feature selection. This, this is a very common word. But why feature selection is important? If you think about it, then you will get the answer. Look at the previous study. In the previous study, we had thousand genes. You know what will be the cost of profiling thousand genes using a sequencer? The cost of the diagnostic, I mean, Profiling 1,000 genes is as costly as profiling maybe the entire transcriptome. Okay, so uh, it is not very helpful. You cannot send it for the RNA sequencing. In India, not even 0.01% labs have RNA sequencer or sequencing machine, right? So here you use feature selection. How do you crunch down these 1,000 genes into uh, 10 genes or 11 genes? Because if you can crunch it down to 10 to 11 genes, you can use RT-PCR. Because RT-PCR is a 96 well plate, right? 8 by 12 plate. It's like a rectangle. So you can use uh, 12 samples, 8 probes, or 8 sample 12 probes. You can use in uh, replicates, right? You can play with that. But that's a small, you know, any RT-PCR machine can profile this. You don't need a sequence. we lost you again <laughs> next slide just with uh, yeah so no i don't know the wi-fi seems to be good uh, but uh, uh, again i'll shut down my video so guys what we did here was that we took the rna seq data from the public and we used feature selection methods uh, multiple feature selection methods 
to crunch down this thousand genes into a set of 11 genes okay and we uh, we talked to aims actually two of my students uh, chitrita and smriti both of them will be graduating in the upcoming year so they used to camp in aims right uh, for many many days and i got help from the uh, you know well, you know lab oncology head ritu gupta uh, professor ritu gupta uh, uh, in conducting this test and the Q, qrt pcr test on a limited number of samples okay so we had about seven um, uh, seven uh, non small cell lung cancer patients blood and 10 healthy individuals blood we uh, used a method developed by professor jayadeva in, um, in iit delhi he is the current head of the electronics department in iit delhi so he developed a very interesting method by which you can uh, take any gene expression any matrix uh, data which is very small in size and you can project it in the eigen space and then you can reverse project it in the original space and you can oversample in this process right so so uh, this is this is what he created so he used this method to actually inflate art create artificial samples uh, so that our accuracies are better right so finally we got a pretty good accuracy which are shown as aucs here and and we kind of uh, with the comp I cannot disclose the data, but uh, with the company uh, that has purchased this technology, we have now validated uh, over 100 samples, uh, you know, of different cancer types where the accuracy is intact. In fact, what we have done is we have validated this on head and neck cancer, uh, you know, uh, cases, right? About 50 head and neck cancer cases. And I must tell you that. Uh, there is no liquid biopsy method for head and neck cancer in india if you go to any tertiary care hospital you won't see a lot of breast cancer or you won't see a lot of lung cancer you will see a hell lot of head and neck cancer because of our tobacco chewing and all these things right so uh, oral cancer i mean so we got about 50 oral cancer samples uh, uh, from our hospital and we have now validated this on that and we have got outstanding accuracy so so oral cancer was not part of our original cohort, okay? But the same set of genes also work, works on the oral cancer. And we probably have the first and only oral cancer liquid biopsy test, okay? So move on, um, uh, Jaspreet. Yeah, so these are the 11 genes which are, by the way, patented now. And we found that there are a lot of uh, well-defined transcriptional regulators, uh, transcription factors that regulate these genes commonly. Yeah, please move on. Um, yeah, so this is the um, AUC plot, uh, as you can see, using uh, three standard methods. Uh, uh, linear discriminant analysis gradient boosting machine in random forest we could attain an accuracy of 99 percent uh, while using eigen sampling and we have validated it on a lot of other existing data sets uh, which are available publicly which you can uh, find in the paper i am not discussing those results here yeah please next slide yeah i just skip this for the interest of time Please move on. So this is the publication. And I should uh, mention here that uh, these two students, right, Chitrita and Smriti, uh, spent a lot of effort uh, going back and forth AIMS. It is not very easy to get things done uh, you know, in India, right? It's very difficult. So they used to come back and cry that, look, I don't want to go to hospital. Nothing happens. Every day I go and come back. I, I shouldn't go, <laughs> right? So please uh, stall the project. So I said, look, you please go, because I am not a fan of pushing people to do things. But in this instance, I pushed. I said, look, you go and camp there. Even if nothing happens, you count the patients coming in and come back, because you really need to go out of your lab. The lab, the air condition are very good, but you need to go out of that, and you need to see how your science may impact people. Right. And they did it and they did a wonderful work. And finally, 
of course with the help of jaydeva on the artificial intelligence side ritu uh, ritu's lab did a lot of hard work in uh, acquiring this uh, patient samples because it takes a lot of effort to convince the patients to give samples and in fact i must also acknowledge people i mean uh, who gave uh, healthy blood uh, samples to us like the smriti and chitrita's lab mates right so they many of them actually gave samples and of course gorov was there and gorov uh, is helping in validation of this method uh, for the commercial purposes as well and yes so that's it and uh, next slide please so it's a very collaborative work so it's a very accurate technology it is non invasive it is low cost uh, you know i i must tell you that when this test is marketed in the next year by next year it should be there available commercially for people to take right it is much more accurate as compared to ca markers and all that which people typically use and pay for and when this test is available right it will be available at a cost right which no other company in the world in the space of liquid biopsy can offer you know why because it is simple it is 11 genes it is looking at uh platelets there is no sophisticated technology any technology needed any lab which can implement rt pcr which has an rt pcr thanks to covid every lab has an rt pcr can implement this liquid biopsy test so this is the only liquid biopsy test molecular liquid biopsy test it's not like a uh, you know elisa kind of a thing right we are not looking at a protein here we are looking at gene expression and we are looking at gene expression of 11 genes it is going to be uh, it is going to cost less than uh, 100 uh, dollars i would say in india right and that's quite a remarkable achievement i think for the students who have worked on this go ahead just with yeah these are my collaborators uh, my supervisor my uh, collaborator in us navin uh, stephanie who i spoke about jaydeva god actually this is a old slide i have i have lot more funding agencies giving me money i have a lot more collaborators and the students are of course the gems right i mean i i have been really fortunate to get very good students i must acknowledge that people like you have done wonderful works and i'm so proud of i mean i get more pride in doing something translational uh, rather than publishing a piece of theory in a very high you know impact journal okay so that's one and okay so i think with this i'm at the end of the uh, presentation i'm i'm happy to take questions if you guys i know there is a lot of audio uh, issues that you might have might have faced so you can re clarify so thank you the balka for the interesting talk uh you have got some compliments in the chat box that also that is oh, that's okay. the process of work so yes okay. questions from the participants 